Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm still Keith from Rampart Communications. Uh, nice to see you all again. Uh, I'm going to do this again. How many of you heard of my company? More than yesterday. I'm, you guys have been part of the largest single day increase in awareness of my company ever. So that's applaud yourselves if you'd like. Thank you. Um, agenda for today, I'm going to talk, uh, reintroduce our company a little bit with a little more detail. I'm going to talk a little bit about the tech that we brought, uh, you know, as a demonstration here and kind of how we arrived at the sort of multidisciplinary, you know, discovery that we have, um, why it's useful, why it's practical, uh, why it's secure. It's ultimately going to be a little disappointing. I'm just going to, <laughs> just going to lead with the bad news because I'm not going to go into proprietary information. Sorry, we're trying to build, build a company out of this. But hopefully it's enough of a taste. Hopefully if it gives you kind of a, you know, a, a, yeah, a taste of what we do at Rampart that kind of makes you interested, and that's the whole recruiting goal here, right? Uh, I'm sure I'm hiring for a lot of the, sim, uh, the same or similar roles to uh, a lot of the other sponsors that are here today. But um, the one thing, the, if there's any daylight between the, the work that, uh, that I can offer and theirs, it's that uh, I don't care if you're a you know, PhD, postgrad, or you know, still working on an undergrad or, or uh, just coming out of high school. I have something that's new and you get to work on it. Um, doesn't matter what you're bringing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be able to teach you something and, and we're going to be able to build from, from that standpoint together. Okay, so this slide uh, you'll recognize from yesterday, but I filled in because, you know, every nerd wants to fill in all the details of uh, the, the other intersections here. So Rampart is a multidisciplinary company that does fundamental research in application or infosec, cryptography, and DSP. And to, you know, to further shed some light on that, you can think of probably uh, some, some of the intersection between application, infosec, and cryptography, right? Now we're using it now. I'm live over YouTube, over... Uh, presumably TLS to a lot of the people that are online. Hi, how you doing? So that's a practical, you know, fast implementation of cryptography, and we use it, uh, you know, uh, regularly. Between applications or or uh, or security and DSP, you have possibly frequency hopping or possibly spreading. There's some, you know, security-like techniques in there, and we'll talk about those a little bit. And then there's between DSP and cryptography, and any physical layer security nerds in the room. Uh, Okay, no, all right, good. Well, we're gonna talk about that a little bit today and why it's not the whole picture, why it doesn't have that sort of practical um, application as of yet, right? So this is where we are. I've helpfully coded on the bottom left the, you know, the sort of themes of the individual slides, so you'll know when to kind of tune out or take a, you know, a one slide nap here or whatever. All right, so quick InfoSec background. We all know the OSI model, right? We all know uh, layer one to layer seven, but um, just, just to get everybody, you know, on the same page, uh, you know, the higher you are, the closer to the user you are. So at the application layer, that's your cat pictures and your memes and, you know, videos and stuff like that. And as you go down the application presentation, dot, 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 data link physical, uh, you get closer to the actual transmission of the data. So everything in between is encoding and encapsulating the data uh, that you want to send, adding routing information, how it gets from point A to point B, how it gets from point A1 to point A2 on its way to B, right? Um, and there's plenty of examples. Again, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but there's plenty of examples of five layer systems, both wireless and, and wired. You know, Wi Fi is one. You know, there's standards that, that kind of you know, pick uh, different ways of doing this, efficient ways of doing it, or just standards of ways of doing it so we all can inter interoperate. Acoustic, like, a, you know, to stretch the model a little bit further than it probably is supposed to go, I am talking, my brain has thoughts, there's application layer, and I am modulating the, uh, I'm compressing the, the air in front of me. This is, Way too. This doesn't fit in the OSI model. I'm sad. I'm sorry. I went went to this, but that, you know, sound is a physical layer as well. Acoustic is a physical layer, sort of modulation as well. So it's how the bits of a message are actually turned into something other than bits, usually, uh, to be moved from point A to point B. Electrical, electromagnetic. All right. Moving into the world of cryptography, we, they have a model as well, and it's way simpler. You have Alice and Bob, two people who want to communicate and Alice sends messages to Bob, or, or sometimes bi-directional, doesn't matter. And you have Eve, or an eavesdropper, in the middle. And the whole goal of cryptography is, how can Alice send messages to Bob over an unencumbered but observable channel by Eve? And sometimes Eve can, you know, there's a character called Mallory who can, you know, inject data or, or what have you. But Alice needs to send messages to Bob, and don't care how they get there, they just get there, and Eve gets a look at them. And how can Alice do that securely? Definitely a simpler model, and there's a lot more assumptions in here, because like the real world is, you know, worse. And Eve exists everywhere. 
at every layer of uh, the application layer. You can have browser exploits, you know, things that are happening at the application layer. I, yeah, that's, that's reasonable. Uh, transport layer things, you know, like, you know, messing with how your packets are routed or what have you. And of course, physical layer exploitation, you know, sometimes called baseband exploitation or sometimes just jamming. That's another physical layer exploitation. That's not accounted for in the cryptographic model, but it's, it's relevant and it's in, in, important to the to reality, right? Uh, uh, yeah, moving on. Okay, getting a little deeper into phi layer security as it exists today. This is a subfield of information theory. The, the field started by Claude Shannon in, in 48. He started the field, he proved its fundamental theorem in one paper. It's a pretty good day for, <laughs> for publishing a paper. But um, since then, a lot of, lot of active research going on here. There's the, there's the concept of wiretap security where Eve gets a look at the channel or gets a look at the information that comes out of the air, wireless being a broadcast medium, right? We have to think about everything that we transmit, it might be available to Eve here, so they're trying to rectify the cryptographic model with the OSI model and come up with something. So the Matthew stuff, you know, pardon me if I'm bringing my own particular brand of nerdery to a different brand of nerdery here, but the important part here is that that, that kind of cursive E function, the encryption function there, takes strings of ones and zeros, turns them into strings of ones and zeros of a different length, M or C, and then uh, they're transmitted. And then the channel, the wireless channel that we're all familiar with, you know, has an effect on it. And my inaccurate short, short summary of file layer security, this is, please, you know, there's some alighting over a lot of detail here, but is there a way that Alice can pre-code or form her message so that Bob receives it cleanly and Eve has a really hard time receiving or can't receive all of it? And if you think about it, that's not, that's not a great sort of standard uh, to set, right? Uh, in the pure cryptographic model, it's Eve, gets, Eve can look at the message and she can't get anything out of it, otherwise it's not secure. But you know, there's, there's, there's semantics here, there's, there's, um, you know, there's churn between the two models, right? So we step back to, to look at sort of the intersection of these two and, and, and why physical layer security is attractive at all. And, and the point is that in reality, in, in the world of DSP, you're transmitting and that transmission is, you know, creates some sort of bubble in which it can be heard, right? You have a uh, coverage range or some SNR and depending on your antenna and link margin and all that fancy stuff, you know, you are broadcasting a message. And, you know, yeah, you can, you can beam form it or you can point, you can try to point it in certain directions, but you are emitting and anyone that's inside that uh, you know, emission bubble or who can buy really good antennas or what have you uh, can hear you, can be that Eve, right? So physical layer security, the bolded point there is physical layer security tries to recover the assumptions that they, we make in the cryptographic model, but you know, it falls short. There's a ton of really good work that's going on there. I, I'm not throwing stones at all. There's not a lot of great practical implementations of it though. Things that work at the speed, at gigabit speeds that, you know, we talked that over, you know, well, not gigabit, but, but you know, some of the faster versions of Wi-Fi are, are getting up there and 5G is pushing like really high data rates. There's no physical layer security measures for that. And importantly, PLS is expressed in terms of bits. How do we, you know, what's the secrecy capacity or, or how, do we, how do we obscure some of the bits from Eve, and not all of them. But the physical layer, as we all know, is the layer of symbols of, of complex baseband I and Q, right? Um, uh, there's a sample domain or a symbol domain or what, what have you. Um, and this is something, finally, we're back to safe territory, right? I, you know, this is good. Uh, from left to right in this generic sort of transmitter, you have the application layer, the pictures of cats and what have you, uh, moving down to just before the physical layer, which is where, you know, actual physical layer security is applied. Uh, the, the, the field of physical layer security is typically applied. We pre-code or we do, we, you know, um, do some clever math to the bits, and then move on to the digital and analog portions of, of the transmitter. But the physical layer is both, the, you know, the edge of that bit, the symbol map on both sides. So it's both the bits and the samples that, you know, I put a 16 quam up there, you know, there's any, any number of constellation diagrams and any ways of representing that, that signal. So, um, yeah out of order than, from the order I remembered it in, but sure, we'll talk about it now, good. Uh, things that are not file layer security, this is, still, this is still in the DSP realm, but I just wanna mention these because they were in the slide earlier. Spreading and hopping 
are spreading as a way to more efficiently use bandwidth and reject interference. It is not, in any sense of the word, a security mechanism. And uh, this is the book on, psych on, on why that's true. There's a guy named Bill Gardner, William Gardner, who wrote literally that book, and he, he makes cyclostationarity.com, uh, and, and really kind of demonstrates that there's no security in spreading a signal. You might make it less obvious, but if I'm looking for cyclostationary signals, or if I'm looking for things that are spread or have repeat copies, or even changing repeat copies, there's dead simple ways of finding them. Likewise, with frequency hopping, I'm moving a signal around, and sure, I may not be able to see the, the pattern that you're hopping in, but there's still a signal there. There's still structure. There's still a constellation. Uh, the way to win at whack-a-mole is not to get really fast at you know, pre predicting where the mole is going to come up. It's to get two or three of your friends and give them hammers, and you all just hit, hit one hole each, right? And, and, and you can stop, and, and you can look at frequency hopping, right? So I just want to point out this, this is not part of formal, formal PLS. Uh, and nor really are there actually true measurable security properties. Yeah, they make frequency hopping is great against jamming because uh, it you know it moves around and the jammer has to follow it. There's no other game there. Um, but effective physical layer security, A, from the cryptographic sense, doesn't make any assumptions about Eve, and B, protects the file layer information, protects actual information of the file layer, not just the information above it, not just bits above it. All right, so... We're in the complex, uh, or in baseband and I and Q, baseband I, Q, which is typically represented as complex numbers. How do I do cryptography here? Right, cryptography in, in the classical, in the, in, the, in the sense we're all familiar with, is plain text bits to ciphertext bits, right? Uh, you know, I, uh, same length, you know, you know, there's some sort of math that happens, but it's all, all happening on bits. And it's a really nonlinear process, and uh, you know you can um, the acid test here, as I call out the the test of a good the output of a good crypto system is that if I can give you a file of encrypted messages and a file of random ones and zeros, you can't tell me which file is which, right? So that's that's easy to do. That's well fairly well understood in in, in the crypt world. So what does that mean in C? In in, in uh, the PDF isn't rendering that. It's supposed to be you know the the, the set of numbers, the, the set of complex numbers. Anyway, um, the in the complex numbers, well, okay, digital signals we represent as, you know, either in, a, in, in serial or in blocks uh, of complex numbers. Thinking about a block of complex numbers or a vector of complex numbers as a band limited, uh, time limited, and defined power signal, right? So this should be fairly familiar. If I take the rights, if I'm critically sampling a signal, I have information, I have all the information I need uh, in, that, in that complex representation to make, uh, you know, to, uh, to represent or to recreate that signal in analog or to demod it if I'm on the receive side and turn those symbols back to bits, right? So, okay, so if indistinguishability in the cryptographic sense is I can't tell two bit strings apart, two files of bit strings apart, then indistinguishability in C means uh, I have a file of Gaussian random noise, you know, random in I and Q, and I have a random looking output of a, crypt, of a crypto logic, right? That are indistinguishable. So E, this curse of E here, again, remembering from a couple of slides ago, instead of mapping from, you know, uh, vectors of bits, you know, from a plain text to a ciphertext vector or how, whatever length, I map from vectors of complex numbers to other vectors of complex numbers. And I've highlighted something here, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this, right? So it maps uniformly is underlined and power is highlighted. So bandwidth and duration, that, that should be fairly clear, right? Complex numbers represent signals with bandwidths and durations. Got it. Like, that's, that's how we think of signals now. The, the, the magnitude of that vector represents the power in that signal. I can, you know, multiply it by, you know, a billion and my, you know, my amplifiers will blow up because that's power going into the amplifiers, right? So that's a scalar of power there. And I want to preserve that power because I don't want to have to change, you know, ideally in the, you know, to, to not upset the analog front end, uh, you know, developers. I don't want to have to change the front end of the radio. So I want the same power coming in and out. Okay. So I map from the same bandwidth duration and power. And then that uniformly word is the key here. How do I uniformly generate signals, uh, uh, from, from an in, you know, given an input, can I map to an output and do the inverse? 
uh, predictably, you know, computationally quickly, um, what have you. Uh, there are so, so, so many wrong ways to do this. Um, this is the, the fun part of fundamental research. Um, uh, there's uh, there's a lot of I, you know there's a lot of sort of half uh, half measures and half ideas out here. I've I've outlined phase encryption here. So taking QPSK points just to keep it simple and say you know using some bit stream as the key change from you know zero zero to, to one one and 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 to flop this around uh, in, you know unpredictably not not just substitute them uh, and this is fine. On the front of it, like there's security that we we can see kind of a path to making something secure there, but you still end up with a QPSK at the end. You still end up with something that has four distinct points. And does anyone else spot the the actual flaw of this? Just going around the room, I want to see how like how lost I I, I have I have gone down the path of here. How much security have you added here? So yeah, so so pre presuming you can. You know, uniformly, equally map. You know, every every baud is mapping to a, a different key. It's not always you know, minus one minus i going to one, one plus i or whatever. The problem with phase encryption is that you've only added, in this case, two bits of security. So I don't. If I'm Eve, I don't care which one it maps to. I will try every single case for every baud and demap them, and find I have four cases. You know, I have two bits of work that I have to do. Uh, you know, we all have computers that can do two bits of work, right? So, and scaling with larger constellations. So this is not actually a great security. It's, there's some security in there, like it's not, it's not nothing. Um, you've also probably introduced a timing problem, right? So if your keys, if your transmitter and receiver get out of sync, and you don't know where, you don't have a way of recovering that, um, then you're suddenly, your, your, your intended recipients are having problems demodding as well. So there's three principal constraints in, in actually building this system. You know, trying to t trying to map uniformly to the, to complex vectors. We need it to be fast. We have to. We can't break things like the fundamental parts of DSB that you know kind of have to happen. Your know, equalization, security, uh, what have you. Uh, and the the cryptologic sort of uh, uh, acid test. In, in, or, excuse me, indistinguishability. Um, under Shannon's maxim, which is the enemy knows the system, right? So we can't have any assumptions about Eve being like, well, Eve is far away, or you know, Eve doesn't have the same number of antennas that I do, so that's how I get away with it. You assume an, uh, an, Eve, an Eve or an adversary with total and complete knowledge of the system. There's nothing you know, ob obscure about what you're doing uh, if you want to claim cryptographic security. All right, so this is like the super disappointing part. Like I'm, I'm not going to say how we do this. I apologize. I know that's, you know, that may not even be in the spirit of an open source conference. Uh, but the point is, like, it's, it's possible. And this is the fundamental advance, right? This is, uh, this is what we've built. We built something that takes any constellation, any constellation-based signal, uh, which means it's medium independent as well, any constellation and maps it to random Gaussian noise in order and time. So faster than the, say, Fourier transform that you're probably using if you're building an OFDM system, or at least as fast as the rest of your, you know, sort of DSP transmit chain, uh, transmit or receive chain. We've done it in a way that has zero impact on the DSP performance side of things. So I've gotten some really, really good questions, and I appreciate y'all coming up and, and, and challenging me on this, right? It's a good scientific method, you know, practice thing to do. Um, but there's no, there's no feature that is not preserved in this transformation, both encryption, decryption side of it, right? So all these little, I've gotten questions on all these things if you can't read them, you know, cluster variance, SNR, PAPR, noise or interference rejection or performance in, in, in the face of noise and what have you. MIMO, you know, you can still do hopping, you can still spread with this. It's just that this is what, you know, the, this is the modulation or this is the, uh, the underlying encoding, right? And it's provable. Right, so it's we have the proofs of work uh, under the cryptographic model. You can map you can map it out. Um, you know we have we've had independent verification of, of this, and we're you know we're trying to uh, bring it to customers. Right. So instead of and, and this little diagram at the bottom here, you have a sync pattern which is not information containing. I can use whatever sync pattern I want. So if I want to look like a Wi-Fi system to an AI, I might put a Wi-Fi preamble on there. If I want to look like I don't know, Bluetooth or, or DVBS or what have you, you know, everything, every non-coherent system 
has uh, some sort of way of recovering timing pilots, what, what have you. Uh, that part is how I recover my timing and frequency, and then everything else is encrypted, if you will. And I don't have to encrypt everything, so one of the things that we, one of the earliest things that we built was an 802.11 AC system that spoke unitary braid division multiplexing to UBDM clients, and it spoke to, you know, your stock iPhone, a normal 802.11, so sort of simultaneously interleaving, right? So I left uh, open some of the, uh, some of the parts of Wi-Fi that, you know, are necessary to do that sort of, you know, management back and forth. So I can build an interoperable system. I don't have to just completely destroy, um, you know, backwards compatibility there too. Cool. So yeah, again, uh, I have a demo out here. Uh, I would be happy to, you know, have people take me up on the offer to record symbols because I can't stand up here and I can't prove to you. At first, I mean, it would take 40 hours on a whiteboard and it'd be fun, but uh, uh, I can't, you know, compress that to a 30 minute talk. Um, uh, but you can prove some of these things to, to yourself. You can prove that I'm transmitting noise over the air. You can prove that my signal is in there. I can turn it, turn it, you know, our, our encryption on and off, and you can see that's happening. Um, happy, happy to do that. I'm a scientist myself, and extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. I, you know, we live to that, to that standard, right? So, the, to the extent that I can do that without, you know, you know, driving my company into the ground, um, happy to do that, right? But we're trying to trying to make something out of it. All right, backing out to kind of why this stuff matters, and this is this is an impact statement, and this should be, you know, this this is bigger than than, than just the, the tech here. Anyone recognize the picture in the middle? No. Uh, this was pulled from a certain space exploration company's telemetry from their certain bird name rockets uh, telemetry that was being broadcast down to the Earth by some enterprising SDR enthusiasts. Kudos to you, right? Uh, the company was sending both the cool outside videos that you see of the rocket going to space and internal videos of this is the liquid oxygen tank. I would also have accepted, uh, uh, what's the thing from Back to the Future? Uh, flux capacitor kind of looks like that a little bit, but you know, half, half points for that. But um, no, this is the inside of a liquid oxygen tank and that was just pulled out of the air. Satellite in particular has this worldwide sort of coverage area, right? And so worldwide attack surface. So yeah, that might it might be funny to kind of punch up at the big company that you know you know has now put encryption on their telemetry at the Mac layer, I'll say. Um, but you know your data might go over satellite. Uh, you know if you if you you know use satellite internet at your home or whatever. And more importantly are the four boxes around it. I love the line uh, from Matthew Van Hoof's uh, Twitter. I found some design and implementation flaws in Wi-Fi again. Right? Like this dude is prolific. And he's finding fundamental, like baked into the ASIC of your phone flaws in, in Wi-Fi. All your phones are vulnerable to, you know, to some degree or another to these things. And they're largely unpatchable. Microcodes sometimes exist to patch these things, but it, it affects you and I. And so there's huge commercial value in making everyone's communications uh, more secure. It matters to you and to I, and it matters that I, you know, you know, I can, you know, I don't have to do IT support for, for my family. I can just say, patch, your, your communications are secure. I don't want to have to teach somebody how to use Wi-Fi or how to update their WPA2 to WPA3 or, or what have you, right? Um, five layer security protects everything, every layer above it, which is a fundamental sort of, you know, change in the attack defense thing. You know, InfoSec, my, my community doesn't do a great job, you know, of defending networks today. We do okay, I'm not throwing stones, like there's, it's a, it's a huge and hard problem. But the, giving the attacker the first move by letting them listen to what you're saying is not a winning strategy, right? And there's other, you know, uh, similar exploits in Bluetooth and, and other baseband exploits. Um, the last point I wanna say about this is, we've been, I've been talking in the sort of sense of I transmit and it's now secure, cool. What happens when I receive though? What's the first step I receive, so the, the samples come down to a baseband processor, you know, in general terms, right? Those baseband processors are these, are the things that are getting exploited, right? So not only are my transmissions secure with UBDM, but if the first step in receiving is to decrypt, not demod, you are invulnerable to baseband exploits now. So there's a, there's a dual sort of, you know, sides of this protection that come in here. So this is what we're doing. We're killing, uh, you know, we're stopping baseline exploitation. We're unlocking new things. You know, 
I'm looking at uh, commercial applications for IoT, you know, the, the things we know about and then the things that are down the road not so far away. You know, I'm fine with a pacemaker that like chirps out its battery status or what have you, but how many of you would, you know, Roger up to have something, you know, an implanted device that talks Bluetooth to it and says, hey, update your firmware or whatever. Like that's, that's certainly a different, you know, sort of step to take, right? So these are the sort of privacy and security implications that, um, that I'm thinking about and that, that we're aiming for at Rampart. So yeah, so that's my talk. Um, hopefully it was not so disappointing, but you know, interesting. And if you wanna work with this, if you wanna build things that meaningfully improve privacy as well as security uh, at the Phi layer and you're a DSP nerd in you know, PhD or in high school, like we're hiring and, and we're looking to you know, sort of innovate in a lot of different ways in this space. So, Love to chat. We'd love to talk about our demo. Um, yeah, great to hear from you. Thanks. I'll take your questions. All right. Any questions in the room? There's a, there's a couple on chat that I'll relay here if there's um, no questions here. Oh, yeah. Neil. Maybe this is kind of an obvious question, but how does this sort of thing hold up to different types of channel impairments like noise and fading and multipath and, and stuff? Those have, there is zero difference between an existing system, whatever, whatever notional system we're talking about operating in those channel environments and a system plus our modulation. It absolutely zero impacts. Um, there's, it, it is lossless in the same sense that a Fourier transform is lossless. You don't think about, oh, I'm going from frequency to time domain and I'm losing bandwidth, I'm losing information about my signal. The Fourier transform is unitary, and that is the mathematical, the fundamental reason why it's lossless, and we are unitary, and the, also the fundamental reason why we are lossless as well. So whatever effect that that channel would have had, you know, if it would have completely wiped out that signal, it would have wiped us out too. We're not magic, to get that out there. Um, but uh, yeah, so no effect, yeah. Um, so a question on the chat from Marcus, um, how would equalization happen then if you, yeah. if you don't have those mo modulation properties? Right, it's a great question. Uh, there was the diagram earlier on here. Oop, here it is at the very bottom of the slide. There, I still use a sync pattern to achieve equal, timing and frequency correction and, and, and equalization, but there's no information in that. It's the same pattern every time. You know, or it changes in depending on which modulation we're talking about. But I can then change it because I have a secure channel underneath. So if I wanted to change that every time or if I wanted to do weird things with that, I, I could. But I perform equalization the same way you perform equalization now on whatever notional system we're thinking about. Yeah, good question. All right, and there is another question online. Um, is there any public research papers about these general techniques? Uh, like, like UBDM. Right. The question. Right. So again, this is new science. This is our, our uh, my company's sort of innovation. We have patents. They're inscrutable. I, I wrote them, and then the lawyers re rewrote them. You're happy to read them, uh, uh, but um, we're not publishing anything right now. Uh, we have a white paper that kind of goes into a little bit more detail on our website, but. Um, Unfortunately, I have to disappoint in that answer. There's not, not anything. Come work with us. You get to see it all. But then, yeah, good plug. All right, cool. Great, thank you. Thank you, Keith.